on, right? <clears throat> well, thank you very, very much for coming. I, I appreciate your attendance, and uh, I want to thank also the faculty of the School of Art at Dartmouth uh, College. It's, uh, it's quite, it's an honor to be invited here to show and, and to talk, and I'm, I'm very honored. I also have met many of the faculty since I've been here. I've been here about a week. And uh, they're all wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, I've met some of the students, too, and, and they're great. And I, I, I assume that there are a number of people in here that are students. And, and I'm actually, when I talk about my work, I'm going to be talking primarily to the students because uh, people who, you know, are my age or about that don't care. You know, <laughs> but um, the um, I, I that that statement that I had written and that Jerry read uh, actually sounded pretty good when he read it, and um, I 
I do think in terms of art having a kind of heroic aspect to it. And of course, it's quite obvious that I paint heroic myths. You know, I don't, I don't know why I started doing that, but I, I find that it gives me the opportunity to make paintings that look the way that I want the paintings to look. It's not so much the myth that's important, it's just that it, it triggers a kind of response in me that allows me to use the kind of painting that I want to do. But I've always thought of, and I'm probably beating this horse too much, but I, I've always thought of art faculties as being heroic. In, in the ancient Greek sense of the word, and if I, I probably got this wrong too, but the, uh, I, I understand that the ancient Greeks thought of heroes as people who tried to do more than they were capable of doing. And so they always failed, you know, in the long run. And, and I think that's sort of a metaphor for, not only for teaching art, but even for doing art. I mean, it's uh, the more you, the harder you try, the more you screw up. Anyway, <coughs> um, what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to show you how I work. And um, what I'm going to show you is an image of an object which exists in Mexico City. It's a statue of a god called Cuauhtlicue, and this god or goddess it's, I think it's both male and female, is a god of regeneration and also sacrifice. And she wears a, a necklace of severed hands and around her neck. And she ha her head is made up of two snakes. And she, Guatlique is the Aztec, or maybe it's an, not Aztec, but it's an a Indian word for, for a skirt of snakes. You know, so it's a really neat thing. And I've always been very taken by it. So this is the way I work. Can you, you want to lower the lights a little bit? Each one of these drawings is the paper is six feet high by, you know, however wide it is. So, and they're all the same size. So that's the way I work. And basically what I do is I, I start out and I make a drawing and then I try to make it different the next time and then I try to make it different the next time. And the idea is that if you make it often enough, you might get it right. You know, you, you might be able to find some way to, to make it look really good. But, um, and I figure the more you do, the more chance you have. Um, there is a, a caveat there, though, because it's possible that you can get bored with what you're doing, right? And so um, what, the, what, I, what I try to do is to get to the point where I'm so bored that I only think about what the thing looks like and not about what it is. And once you get past that stage, then I'm talking to the students now, you know, instead of drawing pine cones, you're actually making a drawing. And, and that's really cool. Anyway, <clears throat> in 1958, I was a student at Pomona College. I was getting ready to graduate. And uh, a very wonderful teacher that I had, a man named Charles Leslie, was, was writing a book, or he had actually written it, and he was getting it published, and it was called 
Now We Are Civilized, which was a, 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 uh, Dr. Leslie was a, an anthropologist, a cultural anthropologist, and he'd written this book on the Zapotec Indians and, and their cultural, um, I guess, how they reacted to each other in a little town called Mitla, which is near Oaxaca, Mexico. And, um, and it was a fascinating, fascinating book. Anyway, he asked me if I would illustrate parts of it. We, I did a map for the frontispiece, and, and this was one of the illustrations. It's just to show you what I was doing in 1958. And um, a lot of the reason it looks like this is because for seven or eight years before I was a student, I uh, worked in an advertising agency. I really wanted primarily to be a cartoonist. I, I really liked the idea of being a commercial artist. W that's what they called them then. And, um, and I thought it would be a good way to make a lot of money. And, um, but then I decided to go to college and, and things changed for me. But I, have, I had those skills. Then, let's see, I gotta find the right button here. Ha. Huh. <clears throat> After graduate school, uh, my wife and I uh, both graduated from Pomona, and then we both went to Harvard, and she, she went to the Harvard School of Education, uh, Graduate School of Education, and, and actually got a degree and I went to the School of Art or Art History at the Fog, and I, I uh, didn't get a degree. Well, at least I, I, was, I was working for a PhD and I quit. And um, it was too easy, you know. So, <coughs> so um, anyway, we, we, didn't, we didn't think about it, you know. What are, what are you gonna do if you just quit school? So we went to live with her mother, and, uh, <laughs> and her mother lived in Mexico City, which was really cool, and she was a, a librarian, a USIS librarian for, for all of Mexico, and really a wonderful, wonderful woman, and, and she, she just said, oh, sure, come on. And, and uh, so, so for three years, I painted and exhibited, and Elizabeth, my wife, painted, and we showed in parks on Sundays selling art to tourists, and it was, it was a great time. I even, even did a little teaching illegally at Mexico City College. And, um, and, and, and this is a couple of the things that I did there. And what they are called are mitos de origen, or origin myths. And, I guess I have to sort of go back a little bit. Um, you're, you're probably not interested in why I paint myths, but I've, I've got a reason. And it's not a, it's not a real good reason either. But um, when I was in, at Pomona, um, I was one of the few artists there as a student in the late 50s who actually painted figures. Uh, and they were pretty dorky. You know, like people smelling flowers and and people doing cats' cradles and and uh, things like that and and um, um, for some reason they weren't really well responded to. I felt by a lot of my peers and and I also thought by the teachers. So one day I was out, or one evening I was out with a group of people and they were all having beer and pretzels and things at a place called Stinky's which is out on Highway 66, Foothill Boulevard, you know. Route 66, you've probably heard the song. And um, the, um, I was, I don't drink by the way, so I wasn't drinking or anything, but I was there just talking to them and, and um, there were a couple of philosophers there, and our philosophy students, and I said, uh, by the way, there's, a, there's another person here this tonight, which is uh, a wonderful, he was a wonderful uh, teacher here, Bob Fogelin, who uh, was a philosophy, philosophy teacher at Pomona, and probably some of these students were his students. <laughs> anyway, I, I said, gosh, I said, what's the matter? Why, 
why can't I, why can't I make paintings that people really like? And, 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 uh, and one of them said, well, that's so easy to tell you. And I said, really? <laughs> said, oh, yes. He says, it's, it's quite obvious. And I said, well, tell me. And he said, well, <coughs> painting doesn't deal with real things. It, it deals with metaphysical things. Wow. So I was, uh, I was trying to, I, I was trying to, to paint automobile accidents, people giving birth, with lots of, with lots of blood, you know. And, and I really liked the idea, and, uh, and that was before they let you into, into the hospital to watch, you know. So I was making up all these things. And, and, uh, and so I thought, well, that's, that's it, and I went home and I looked in the dictionary and I, I, I found that metaphysical <laughs> would translate to, uh, instead of birth, it would be origin, you know. That, that would be the metaphysical equivalent of birth. And, and uh, so I thought, wow, okay, so I'll do origin paintings. And then I, because I was in Mexico and I liked the word mito, uh, they became origin myths. Well, that's how it started. <laughs> and let's see, um, next. Ah, there you go, here it is. Okay. But it didn't take long for me to, I, I'm, I'm kind of literal in my thought process and I, I'm not a deep thinker, I'm not a scholar, um, and I, but I, I, in a way, I'm exactly what I tried to get. Uh, by the way, I taught many years at the University of Washington, and I tried to get my students to, particularly the more advanced students, to sort of dumb up when they <laughs> came to solve a problem because most of them were so smart that they, they had trouble working. You know, and, and there's, uh, by the way, I don't know if you know this uh, engraving or not, but there's a wonderful engraving by Albrecht Dürer, who was a 16th century German artist, and it's called Melancholia II. And it shows, I should have brought in a slide of it, but it shows um, a figure, which is undoubtedly an angel of some kind, sitting with his head in his hands, and he's sort of, sitting there like this, and at his feet are the tools of man's knowledge. There's an astrolab and all these sorts of scientific tools and, and books, and so he, he knew everything. And, uh, but the problem was he couldn't act because every time he thought of something to do, he could think of an alternative. You know, so it's like, well, I'm gonna do this, oh, but, no. <laughs> And, and that's, what, that's what happens to people when they try to do art, too, and they think about it too much. So anyway, fortunately, I was born that way. I'm sort of, I sort of dumbed up right from the beginning. So, <laughs> so um, when, I, when I started working, uh, this, this one on the left uh, is uh, Lita and the Swan, and um, the... Um, Instead of a mito de origen, it became a myth painting about origin. See, so it became something quite different. So it became like, like uh, Lita was approached by a swan who was really Zeus, and the swan, according to Ovid anyway, the swan laid his head in her lap and she petted it, and then it swam off and she laid a couple of eggs. I mean, there was no sex or anything. But, but um, then, then William Butler Yeats came along and wrote a poem about it in this middle period when he was like 34 or something. And even though he was gay, it was the most expressive uh, kind of, um, I mean, very, very sexual. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It just, uh, if, particularly if you're young, it's a real, <laughs> it's a real knockout. But, um, but, but then, and then there's the, the other one where Zeus turns into a bull and he seduces Europa and swims across the ocean to Crete. And anyway, I'm gonna have to go on really more rapidly. So, 
So I started painting things that were myths. And then in 1967, those, those other two were like 1961 or 1962. In 1966, actually, um, I, I had my first idea to maybe deal with a myth that I've been continuing to do for the rest of my life, and that is the labors of Hercules. And these are a couple of the first charcoal drawings that I did. They, they're on uh, vellum bristle, you know. I mean, it's not really good paper, but it, uh, I, I always like that paper. Um, and this is uh, Hercules with, uh, with a Nemean lion. That's the first labor. And then the second labor is Hercules slaying the Lanarian Hydra. And, and they're wonderful the stories because they, they really are impossible tasks that he's, he's trying to solve. And, and he eventually solves them. But in doing it, he sometimes kills his friends or, or uh, you know, he has to cheat somebody or he's, it's, he can't just do it straightforward. He has to find a way to do it. I always thought it was a great political metaphor. But, uh, <clears throat> uh, but I kept on working. I, I, it was mentioned that I went to Rome for a couple of years. And the first thing that I did in Rome was another uh, series of Labors of Hercules. And this is the, um, the first, once again, Hercules and the Nemean lion. And um, in this case, you can see that I, I cut the figure of Hercules out of the paper, and there's a piece of paper behind it. And I continue to do that because it's my way of erasing marks. I had put a lot of marks in there. He was all muscular and all that sort of thing. It looked really awful. So I just cut it out. And, it, and, then, and then, all of a sudden, I thought, that's really cool because the lion is additive, and it's got all these marks, and the hero is subtractive. So those are opposites. And, and that's what I was trying to get anyway, was that these two sort of opposite things were wrestling each other. So it becomes a visual way. And then uh, you remember the first Lita I did. Well, this is another Lita that I did in in Rome, and it shows the sort of thing that this was in 66 or 67 to 69. I was experimenting with uh, cantilevered canvases so that the top part of the canvas would lean out and things would hang down from it, sometimes a piece of plexiglass with something drawn on it, and it would cast a shadow on that. And the reason I started doing that was because I went to a museum in Venice and it showed pieces from a church that were sort of hanging out like that. It, it was so cool to sort of stand there and become part of the art because it was, it was in over, coming over you. So, um, but um, at that time, I was quite a bit younger and uh, trying to make things as erotic as I could. <coughs> Well, in 1975, I went, I, every decade I've done many, many labors of Hercules. And there's the, once again, the figure's been cut out. And uh, you can see these, these are actually oil on paper. And the paper is uh, five feet by five feet, uh, one inch, the size of the paper. And, um, there were 10 of them. There weren't 12, there were 10. And, um, and that's, that's the first one, and then that, that shows them all. It's, it's like 25 feet long. And um, I, I did them in my studio, which I still work in, which is in the basement of my house. And I, I don't have that big a space to work in, so I, I couldn't see them all together. So I would maybe do two of them, and then I roll them up or put them away, and then I do two more. And, and um, when I finally saw them, when they were finally hung up, I was mortified. I thought, my god, I, I really blew it. And um, um, you're probably not sophisticated enough to know why, but I'll, I'll tell you. <coughs> the, um, you'll notice that the, the four panels that are, well, let's see, there are two panels on the right and they go up and down. 
And then there are these, the one with the bird and the figure and the figure of the woman and the boar up there. That four panels stops your vision. And the reason it stops your vision is because this figure is going up to that corner and that leg is coming down to that corner and her leg is going up to that corner and the pig snout is going down to that corner. And it, it forces you to, I mean, you probably didn't notice it, but the longer you look at it, it forces you to just sort of stop at that point. And I thought, geez. It, uh, so two years later, or actually it was a year and a half later, I, uh, I did another one. And, and this one actually, it's bigger, but it's, uh, it's only in two panels. But it's because I screwed up on the other one that I decided to, to do this one. And, and you'll notice also that in this one, I, I tried to make each panel sort of a different visual system so that each labor would look different. And then in the late 80s, I did big monoprints, um, like the one on the left. And, and, and a monoprint is where you print on paper and you get a single print. And what, what I did was, um, my wife has been doing monoprint since she was in high school in Mexico. And, and I used her technique, which is to roll out ink on a large surface, put a piece of paper down on it, draw on the back of the paper, and then pick it up. And, and you have basically uh, a reverse drawing on the other side. And then um, this painting over here, <coughs> that was done in 1995. And then um, in the year 2000, my son and I went to Greece with our families, uh, my wife and, uh, and his two-year-old twins and his wife. And he photographed the the sites of the labors of Hercules, at least in the Peloponnese. And this is a hill in Lerna, in the, uh, not in Lerna, in uh, Nemea. And that's the Nemean lion. So he, he photographed them, made big photographs, and then I painted on the photographs. That's the uh, Canarian hind over there, or Carinarian hind. This is, this is Stymphalos, and that's the uh, Hercules fighting off the Stymphalian birds, and there he is. Uh, digging, uh, trying to dig all the dung out of the staples of Aegeus. Then uh, in the process of doing all these labors of Hercules, I, I got a commission to do a piece for the State House of Representatives in, in Olympia, Washington. And because it was Olympia and because I thought the labors of Hercules was a great political metaphor, I, um, I submitted that and that, that was accepted. And this is the, uh, the first panel, just to show you that I'm, I'm still developing it. And that, I, I don't mind cell phones at all, actually. It doesn't bother me at all. Uh, you can even talk if you like. <laughs> the, um, the, this, is, this shows how the murals looked above the gallery where the visitors sat and then the, the legislators would sit down below. And uh, I can show you how it looked when you just sort of looked flat on. This would be the north side, and that would be the south, or maybe it's the east and west, but they'd be the opposite sides of the chamber. Um, the, for, for whatever reasons, they, they were not totally pleased with the piece. And uh, so, so it's no longer there. But I thought it looked really good. And um, it's, it's 44 feet long and 11 feet high, each piece. And, and uh, <clears throat> what I liked best of all was the kind of figure ground reversal that was going on so that it, it actually moved visually across the wall. And I, I used some of the techniques that they used in the golden section, um, you know, the, the thing that they did with murals in the late Renaissance. But, but mostly I was moving along by having things sort of pick up architectural pieces and, and in the building and, and visually and sort of move your eye back to the mural. But I little did I think, I mean, I didn't think enough. And uh, what happened was that 
the legislators who get bored, you know. I mean, they sit there and they, they have to listen to all these, like, like you're here sitting, listening to me, you know. They just, <laughs> like this. And, uh, and, and their, their attention would wander and they'd look up and they'd see this Rorschach plot and, uh, and they'd think all kinds of things. And, um, <clears throat> and then they said, that's what I was painting. <laughs> so, so anyway, <clears throat> I've done, a, I've done other um, public art pieces. The one on the left is a piece that I did for the kingdom. It's no longer in existence. It was imploded for the, <coughs> what was it, uh, Paul Allen's uh, whatever. It's a, it's a football stadium. But um, it, was, uh, it was done on an elevator and it was called uh, Tumbling Figure Five Stages. Um, they, it, it actually, it was an interesting problem. I did this one before I did the, the thing in Olympia. And um, I was gonna do it in lead and score it and make, and it was, it was gonna be really very beautiful. But I found out that lead slumps and it's sort of like glass, you know, so, so if you put a lot of lead up there and there's a lot of gravity on it, it eventually, sort of just falls off. So I, um, I used half inch aluminum plate and all of the um, black areas are the aluminum and then the, the areas that are the figurative areas are just the concrete that is the, the uh, elevator shaft. And this is not inside the dome but it's, it's inside the outer concourse and, and uh, outside the inner part of the dome. Um, the, um, the paint on the aluminum was called Secret Fighter Plain Black, and it's, uh, it's an Enron, Enron enamel, and uh, it actually absorbs light. And it's what they put on the nose cones of airplanes so that when they're flying into the sun, the sun doesn't bounce back into their eyes, supposedly. Then the other piece was a piece that I did for uh, the Opera House, the old Opera House. Um, and it's, it was based on a poem that I also became familiar with at Pomona College. One of the reasons I enjoy going to Pomona College is exactly the reason you're gonna enjoy going to Dartmouth. You learn so many more things than you intend to. You know, you, if, you, if you go to a, a technical school, you learn exactly what you want to. But you go to a college and people are always surprising you with things that that you never thought you'd be interested in. <laughs> and there was this um, teacher at Pomona that let me do a term paper in a poetry class by doing a set of etchings. And uh, I did uh, etchings that were based on Wallace Stevens' poem, 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. And I liked the idea of doing 13 or 12 or many, many pieces because it gives you a lot of opportunity to keep working. Anyway, uh, this is a large piece that I did in 1984 for the Opera House, and I'll show you, um, this, is, this is from the other end, and that's one of the panels. And it, they're paper, and they're behind plexiglass boxes, and, and it's a beautiful, beautiful poem. If you've never read it, um, it, it would be an introduction to Wallace Stevens. Uh, the first verse is, among 20 snowy mountains, the only moving thing was the eye of a blackbird. It's all in haiku format. It's all about blackbirds and, and death and, uh, and life. And, uh, and he was a wonderful, wonderful poet, as was Homer. So, <clears throat> oops, wrong way. Uh, I have a drawing, the one on the right is a drawing that is in the exhibit that's um, out there now. And uh, um, I wanted to show, particularly I wanted to show Jerry Otten <coughs> where, it, where it was sort of created for. The one on the left is a, sort of an installation drawing that I did for a, um, a gallery in Portland, Oregon. It's called the Blackfish Gallery. It's a, a cooperative gallery. It's not a commercial gallery. And uh, so 
I wanted to do, I, I show in a commercial gallery and I have for 40 years, but, but uh, I wanted to do something <coughs> that perhaps wouldn't be saleable, but that would be, you know, look interesting. And <coughs> so the, the big pieces on the left there are 11 feet high and, and, and the drawing itself is eight feet high, but you can see it down at the end there, how small it is relative to the rest of the, the and I was trying, for, for, for decades I've been trying to get some kind of transition, some kind of visual transition between one myth and another myth because you get somebody like, like Theseus who is kind of like Hercules but he's a hero and uh, <coughs> he was a Lapith and the Lapis battled the centaurs but Theseus also killed the Minotaur and so I thought, Wow, well, I could have him kill the Minotaur and then go battle the, the centaurs. So you see him there, um, he's black on this side, and then he's white on the other side. Where he's killing the Minotaur, he's white, and then on the other side, he's, he's stabbing a centaur, I think, or he's spearing the centaur. And, and he's black. So, so, so I was trying to do something really cool and, and uh, could, nobody liked it. So <coughs> but that's all right. Then I did a, and then when I, when I, when I find a subject that I find interesting or that I, that I think has the possibility of leading to, well, I have to admit, the, the reason I paint probably, well, I have several reasons, but one is that it's, you know, it's about all I know how to do, but, but the other reason is I, I always wanted to make a painting that when people came up in front of it, they would fall on their knees, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've done that seeing some paintings myself. There's a painting in Boston that it just, it just, I actually, we, we spent three days in Boston before we came here from our trip from Seattle, we stopped in Boston. And we did that, from my point of view, primarily to go to the Isabella Gardner Museum because there's a Titian there that is just great. It's, it happens to be a rape of Europa and I think that's what led me to do my first Europa and the Bull. But um, it is one of those paintings that just can change your life. But <clears throat> anyway, I, so I, I did a bunch of paintings of, of uh, lapis and centaurs. You can look up these stories on the web, you know, if, you, if you're interested. The, the, the story in a nutshell is that the lapis and were people and the centaurs were part people and part horse. And, and I was actually doing this about the time of the first Gulf War. And, and uh, I began to think of the centaurs as not being as, as sophisticated in warfare as the, as the lapis because they used trees and stones and the, and the lapis had swords and, and uh, um, spears, and, uh, and of course the lapis killed all the centaurs. And it was because the centaur, the centaurs couldn't hold their liquor and they were invited to, they were cousins with the lapis and they, the centaurs were invited to a wedding with, and they ran off with the bride, you know, and I don't know, they did some unspeakable thing, like they probably, you know, had him, had her ride around on her back or something. They licked her or something, and um, but um, the lapis got really mad and just killed them all. So, oh, wrong side again. Sorry, I, I should. Uh, and I'm pointing at the wrong way. I'm sorry. <coughs> I, I've been told. Anyway, the uh, aside from doing a whole lot of. Uh, of the same subject matter again and again over the years, and I, I do that a lot. I, I keep doing Leda, I keep doing uh, Perseus Medusa, I keep doing 
lock on. I just keep doing them every five years. I do more and more. I, I also like to work in polyptical structures. I like to work in triptychs and, and, and more than triptychs, like the 12 or the 13 or, or something. And so um, when I work on something like the Rape of Europa, I, I iconicize it in a way so that it's no longer a picture of the bull swimming across uh, water with the uh, beach in the background and the, and the putti doing somersaults above and all this kind of wonderful pictorial uh, thing. I, I sort of just sort of make icons out of each stage. And it, this is a big, big painting. Each, each panel is, um, well, it's big. I, I don't know. It's, it's like 88 inches square each panel. And um, that's the middle one. And then, oh, I did it again. I did it again. Oh, OK. This is um, the left panel, and this is the right panel. And, and, uh, and in, in addition to having the image change, I'm trying once again to do a different kind of systemic approach to the paint. So in this case, it's primarily additive. I just slather on lots of paint. I may take some off, but I keep slathering it back on. The one over on the right, I, I put a lot on, then I take a, most of it off, and, and you, so you get a kind of a scumbled surface. And of course, this has color, and that's just black and white. And then I cut part of the figure of Europa out so that it has a kind of uh, vacantness to it, which is different from how it looks here. <coughs> I, I mentioned that I keep doing the Letus too, and this is one that I did, um, I think it's like 1995 or 96. And, um, and the reason I was able to go back to Lita was because I was reading a children's book, and what it talked about was how Lita was taking a bath in a pond, and that this swan you know, got in the pond and swam up, and I thought, gosh, that makes sense. And I, but I, you know, I'd looked at all these other leaders that people had done. There weren't any ponds. It was all just a big duck waddling up through. <laughs> the, and, and so, um, so I, uh, and, and so I thought, well, I have a whole new reason to paint Lita. Now, it's not that I haven't done it before, but, but I thought these were better because I was able to get a kind of, rhythm with even the, the parts of the figure that are under the water, if you just took out all the rest of the stuff, they would look good, you know, because I'm, I'm really conscious of what those shapes look like together, not just as part of the figure, but as marks on a page. Oh, I did it again. Then um, the, um, I do, I do uh, quite a bit of printmaking, mostly woodcuts, but I, I, I did a series of etchings of Lita and the Swan, and you'll notice that in this case, it's very clear that, that the first Lita is just a bitten line etching. It's just line on, uh, on white page. The second Lita, these are big, by the way. They're about, they're about that size. The second Lita is dry point. So it's just, I just scratched it, and I used a, a, a nail, you know. And the third Lita is just Aquatint. So, so even though they're all part of the same kind of sequence of Lita and the swan, where the swan is swimming up and then they're, they're having uh, their, well, they're confronting each other. Or let's see, how did they say it in the, actually, um, she actually was visited they, in the, in the, um, let's see, in the 19th century, they would say that somebody was visited by their husband and it meant that they had sex, right? So, so anyway, Lita was visited by her husband the same night that she was seduced by the swan. So that's why she laid two eggs. And, <laughs> and, um, and in one leg, in one egg was uh, Castor and, Helen of Troy, and in the other egg was 
Pollux and uh, Clytemestra, you know, so the sis uh, sister. So, um, so they were sort of half gods and half people. And, and talk about origin, I mean, it, it sort of was the origin of the new age in Greece and, and the whole Trojan War thing was sort of a, a thing that happened between the ancient Greeks and the modern Greeks, you know. So, uh, and then the one on the right is just a drawing, you know, so I, but I just keep doing them again and again because, well, I did it wrong again. What did I do? I pushed the wrong button, right, okay, I got gotcha. you. <clears throat> oh, and then I, you know, and then I change the format a little bit and do them up and down instead of across. And, and, and this, uh, if any of you are interested, this is really an easy way to paint. And I'd be happy to show you how to do it. It's, it you can't fail. You put down one color, you put another color over the top, you scrape off the first color, it's done. Uh, when I turned 60, um, I thought maybe I was old enough to try something really hard. And so you'll notice that most of the things I've done have been done by other artists. And, uh, and, and most of them are basically cliches, they call them cliches. And that's one reason why I did them, because I wanted to make them so they weren't so cliche anymore, so people looked at them again. So I thought, well, I'll try Goya, you know, and he did a painting called uh, Saturn uh, Devouring His Children. And I wanted to get into doing what's called cosmogonic mythology rather than the, the things about gods and, and, and heroes. I wanted to talk about how the universe was created and the ancient Greeks described it in terms of Uranus and Cronus and Theia and Gaia, you know, their wives. And um, so I did six images of Cronus devouring his children, which Cronus was the Greek equivalent of Saturn, which was Roman, you see. So, and uh, so this is number one on the right and, or on the left, and uh, number five on the right. If you're interested in seeing the other four, I, I've got slides of them. So <laughs> but the, um, then after I did that, oops, I pointed. I um, decided to do the first uh, part of the cos cosmogonic mythology, and that's where Uranus and Gaia were. Um, they were the f main forces in the universe. And um, there was nothing else. There was just them. And they were continually coupled. And I guess they were having sex all the time. And that, but they never disjoined. And so um, they could never have any children, you know, but, but still, all the pro the whole process was going. It must have been very uncomfortable for Gaia, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so um, Gaia then uh, figured out a way to give birth to one of these titans, which was Cronus, and so she got him away and um, substituted something else, or, or somehow fooled fooled Uranus, and uh, then she conspired with Cronus when he'd grown up a little bit and, and asked him to uh, castrate his father. And um, so Cronus was very happy to do that. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> and this is, um, this, this, the one on the, the left is the first one that I did. This is a really big painting. I mean, it's like 100, 100 10 inches across. And, uh, and then the, the other one is uh, one, number four. And um, anyway, what happened then was uh, there was this tremendous explosion. And 
Uranus went shooting off into the heavens and, and there was all this blood and everything that went everywhere and that, that was what populated the earth. You know, it's a, it's a great theory. And uh, the, um, uh, but as he was hurtling off into space and he became the firmament or the universe, um, he yelled down at Cronus and said, I, I throw a curse on you, you creep. He said, I, the, the, your children will do the same to you. And that's why Cronus ate his children. See, because he didn't want them to, to kill him. And um, of course, um, they got him. I, I mean, he ate him, but his wife, Thea, got Zeus away from, from him. And, and Zeus uh, gave him some kind of purgative. And, and he vomited up all of his children. And they were the gods. And, and that's what we're living under now. <laughs> <coughs> so. Well, the third, the third uh, part of the uh, cosmogonic mythology that I, I determined, I, I'm sure it's not the actual third part, but it was the battle of the gods and the giants. And there are some images in the gallery that, that are part of that. This, this is the first painting that I did of the battle of the gods and the giants. And I generally work very large at first, and then I do a whole lot of preliminary paintings after I finish the main painting. I predate them too, so that people think that I made the big one uh, after the little ones. But <clears throat> and then um, on the right there, that's um, an image of the Iliad, and I, I, that's what I've been recent, most recently been working on. And actually, I, I hope to work on the Odyssey while I'm here at Dartmouth. But uh, I find it extremely difficult. And if there are any philosophers in the audience who would like to tell me how to do it, I'd, uh, you know, some word like metaphysical, I, I'd be very, very thankful. I, uh, I, I want to, I should end, I know, and I want to end on, on saying that a lot, uh, as most art faculty, I, um, I feel that I am both a Greek and a Trojan. So, thank you. <laughs>